I've covered U.S. politics for a fair few years. Presidential primaries, presidential elections, midterms, off-year elections, everything. And if you spend enough time talking to voters, you kind of hear it all, including these days some rather out-there conspiratorial stuff. But in all my years, there's one thing I've never heard. I've never met a voter who talks about the debt ceiling. Not a single voter has ever said to me, I can't vote for them. They raised the debt ceiling. In the coming months, the U.S. will once again reach its quote-unquote borrowing limit, its quote-unquote debt ceiling. What that means in layman's terms is that the federal government will have borrowed all it's authorized to do by law and, key point, won't be able to pay for the spending that Congress has already taken on. Let's be clear, there is no reason not to raise the debt ceiling when the time comes. Not raising it is not about economics, it's about politics. More on that in a moment. But just a reminder, the US Congress has raised the debt ceiling at least 78 times in the past 60 years. 78 times, it's a pretty regular thing. For almost a century, raising the debt limit was one of those arcane, dare I say, boring things that Congress simply did. In fact, an early version of it was created by Congress during World War I back in 1917 as a way of making it easier for the government to borrow to pay for the conflict. And when Congress established the modern debt ceiling in 1939, it was a way of granting autonomy to the Treasury Department to do its job, to borrow as it needed, to pay for things that Congress had already authorized. Again, past spending, not future. So the idea of the debt ceiling as a barrier, a safeguard against overspending, is entirely made up by the Republicans. It's fictitious. In fact, it's as fictitious an idea as Republicans being the noble guardians of that limit. When Donald Trump was in the White House, Republicans voted three times to raise or suspend the debt ceiling, and they had support from Democrats as they did it. Oh, you don't remember drawn-out battles during the Trump years over the debt ceiling? You don't remember sanctimonious GOP press conferences about saddling our children with debt? Well, that's because they didn't happen. They didn't happen during the Trump years, just like they didn't happen for the first eight decades that the debt ceiling was in place, including the debt and deficit-heavy Ronald Reagan years and George W. Bush years. Funny that. Only after the 2010 midterms, only after those midterms, the midterms that Republicans won, the Republican red wave, that shellacking, as President Obama called it, only then did the GOP weaponize the debt ceiling as a tool of zero-sum partisan politics. I told Speaker Boehner, I've told uh, Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, uh, I've told Harry Reid, and I've told Mitch McConnell, I want them here at 11 o'clock tomorrow. We have run out of time, and they are going to have to explain to me how it is that we are going to avoid default. So to even entertain the idea of this happening, of the United States of America not paying its bills, is irresponsible. It's absurd. The financial well-being of the American people is not leveraged to be used. The full faith and credit of the United States of America is not a bargaining chip. Throughout the Obama years, Republicans would wait until the very last hour, down to the minute almost, for the U.S. to be on the brink of defaulting on its debts and then use the debt limit battle to pressure Democrats to cut future spending. And they would make Americans believe that they were being responsible. President Obama was right. It was absurd. Raising the debt ceiling does not authorize more spending. It simply allows the country to pay for spending that Congress has already committed to. As the Speaker said two years ago, it would be, and I'm quoting Speaker Boehner now, a, a financial disaster not only for us, but for the worldwide economy. President Obama and then GOP House Speaker John Boehner faced off over the debt ceiling multiple times. They were an almost annual spectacle. But they were more than a spectacle, they had real consequences. In 2011, S&P reduced the United States of America's AAA credit rating for the first time ever. And other credit rating agencies joined S&P, Standard & Poor's, and raised red flags about this country's credit. A default could well have tanked the global economy because the one country trusted to pay its debts would not have been able to do so. John Boehner, for all his sins and flaws, blinked in 2011. We didn't default. Even a hard-right GOP filled with Tea Party types didn't go through with it. 
But my question today is, Boehner was barely able to pull his caucus back from the brink. What makes you think that a future speaker, Kevin McCarthy, could? Why should we have any faith in an even more right-wing congressional GOP in 2023 to not crash the US and global economies? I mean, they're not hiding their plan to play reckless political games with the debt ceiling, the kind of games that could cost you your job, your home, your livelihood, and millions of others. Just listen. And are you willing to risk the US defaulting on its debt as leverage uh, to impose these spending cuts? I support that strategy. Wouldn't it be a normal thing if we're $31 trillion in debt not to just give a blank check, to actually change our behavior? The first person we heard in that clip there was South Carolina freshman GOP Congresswoman Nancy Mace, who has branded herself as a bit of a moderate. Does that sound moderate to you, what she was saying? And then there's, of course, Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House in waiting, if you will, if they win, that is, who would not rule out cuts to Medicare or Social Security when asked about his demands in the next debt ceiling battle. But the most succinct view of the GOP priority, the GOP plan, comes from Indiana Congressman Jim Banks, who is expected to be the number three Republican in Congress if they retake the majority. He called the debt ceiling recently a major leverage point for the Republican Party. A major leverage point. So entitlements could be at risk, along with any other Biden priorities on climate or social spending. Question then, what can President Biden, who, remember, lived through all those obama boehner battles, he was vice president, what can he do right now? What will he do? Well, for one, he could put his weight behind legislation to get rid of the debt ceiling and eliminate these dangerous, stupid showdowns once and for all. It seems like a no-brainer, just get rid of it. But former Senate institutionalist turned U.S. President Joseph Biden won't do it. Sorry, he will not. On the debt ceiling, do you support the permanent repeal of the debt ceiling, sir? The permanent repeal of the debt ceiling? What do you mean? Yes. You mean just say we don't have a debt limit? No debt limit. No. I'd be irresponsible. Irresponsible? No, no, Mr. President, what's irresponsible is knowing that Republicans under Kevin McCarthy will use the coming inevitable debt ceiling standoff to hold the country and the global economy hostage, alongside the president's own agenda and his 2024 prospects. And doing nothing right now to stop them, that is irresponsible. There's a reason why even the normally supportive and centrist liberal writer Jonathan Chait in New York Magazine recently pointed out, recently wrote that Biden, quote, blundered into a crisis that he has a short period of time to resolve, and if he fails, it could very well destroy his administration. Destroy it. It's both astonishing and scary how Democrats have bought into the GOP fiction about the debt ceiling. It's not some core principle of economics to have a de debt ceiling. We're the only country in the entire Western world, other than Denmark, that has one. And it's not something that voters will punish Democrats for lifting or repealing. Because as I mentioned at the start, no voters are talking about the debt ceiling and never are. So Democrats, please, please stop giving the Republicans a weapon with which to beat you. I'm joined now by Democratic Congressman Brendan Boyle of Pennsylvania. He sits on the House Committee on the Budget, and he has a plan to get around the debt ceiling. Congressman, thanks for joining me on the show. Even if Joe Biden were to come out in favor of repealing the debt ceiling, how do you get past a GOP filibuster in the Senate? 60 votes. What's your plan? So first, I wish every one of my colleagues and every American voter could watch the six-minute segment that you just did laying out the absurdity of this issue. Um, right now, there is a loaded gun pointed at the American economy. It is pointed, uh, being held by Republicans, pointed right at our economy. But the good news is we actually have almost two months to be able to disarm it. And the way to do that is to pass the legislation I have with John Yarmuth in the House, the Budget Committee Chair, as well as Dick Durbin in the Senate. And that is simply end once and for all this political food fight and this nonsense yeah. over the debt ceiling. And the way to do that is simply transfer the authority to raise it over to the executive branch, with Congress still retaining a role to overrule that if they ever were to, which of course there would never even be a, a vote. Um, now, in terms of how to get that done, 
we can clearly pass it in the House. We have a majority. We will have yeah. that majority through January 3rd, no matter what happens in the election. In terms of the Senate, obviously the stumbling block is to get to 60 votes. But I do hear whispers that there are Senate Republicans who actually don't want to go through this whole absurd soap opera in just six to nine months from now. For Mitch McConnell, for example, and a few other Senate Republicans, this will put them in an awkward position when Donald Trump is inevitably tweeting or whatever you call it on Truth Social, saying, don't raise the debt ceiling, don't be weak, so stick with Trump. So I do think we actually have an opportunity here where at this moment, their political interests, a few of them at least, align with doing the right thing. I wish I could be as optimistic as you, Congressman, but Joe Biden is an on board. Even, <laughs> even yeah. Bernie Sanders opposes getting rid of it. Have a listen to him. So you side with President Biden on this. You, you, you raise the debt ceiling, but you keep, yeah. you keep it. Yes. He wants to raise it, but still keep the actual device. I, I wonder, Congressman, why can't people on your side of the aisle, like Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, why can't they see how damaging politically this is? You called it a gun to the head. Do they not see what's coming down the line? Do they not hear the Republicans? I just don't get it. Yeah, so I've actually been, I've been in Congress eight years and I've been working on this issue my entire time here. And, and I changed or uh, transformed a bit for pragmatic reasons. My initial legislation going back years ago was simply to get rid of this absurd debt ceiling concept once and for all, for all the reasons that you outlined. But I came to realize that whether it's Bernie Sanders or others who have been here a while, um, that is perhaps, a, a, for whatever reason, a step they're unwilling to take. So that's how I came up with my reform idea that says, all right, for whatever reason you want to keep this idiotic concept of the debt ceiling, fine. Let's just take it away from Congress having to act proactively. Let's instead enable the executive branch and the Treasury Secretary and the President to have this authority. And if Congress, for whatever reason, wants to act, we would still have that ability to override it. But I want to avoid yeah. the situation that we're headed toward, but it which be, is essentially it, it wouldn't a default be a cliff by edge. accident. Exactly. It wouldn't be a cliff and edge every every year or whatever every it is. Every six months, so let me ask every you this. year, yeah. Congressman, let me ask you this. Was it a mistake for Democrats to just go along with debt ceiling increases and suspensions during the Trump era, knowing that Republicans would never reciprocate once a Democrat was in the White House? Did you guys get played by the GOP again and again? No. I, not me, at least. I've always been consistent. I think I voted for every increase in the debt ceiling because it is absolutely an absurd accident of history that now the Republicans are using as leverage to get the policy wins that they want. And that's not me saying it. That is them breaking brazenly saying it. So look, if we don't do this in November or December, then shame on us, because we know next year the Republicans are irresponsible and reckless enough that they will say you have to agree to deep cuts to Social Security, deep cuts to Medicare, getting rid of the Inflation Reduction Act advances that we just passed. Why in the world would we sleepwalk our way into that scenario? Let's act in lame duck while we still have the opportunity. Well said. One last question, though. There is an argument right now that the Democrats don't have a closing message on the economy ahead of the midterm, something clear and persuasive to deal with GOP attacks on inflation and gas prices, etc. Is that the reason why your party is struggling in the polls, why Republican candidate Mohammed Oz has made a comeback in the polls in your state of Pennsylvania? Well, first, Pennsylvania is always the biggest battleground state in the nation. It was the biggest battleground state in 2016 and 2020 presidential elections. And it is, I believe, the state that will actually determine control of the United States Senate. So that's perennial, no matter what the circumstances uh, may be in any given election. In terms of our closing message, we have to first acknowledge the real pain that's out there. There's a worldwide inflation issue. It's actually worse in most of uh, Europe and most of the world than it is here. But it is still bad here nonetheless. So number one, we acknowledge that. But number two, we actually have a plan to do something about it. What's the Republican plan? Own the libs. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert doing crazy things on TikTok. They will make this situation 10 times worse. It is our side yeah. that is actually lowering drug costs, lowering energy costs, and the other side that won't do a damn thing about it.